Um, this is Brian Sapp from, from uh, Tapjoy, and he's going to be talking about monetization of your app outside of the game design elements in, a, in sort of a higher level way than I think other people have. Um, so with that as an introduction, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Brian, and we're going to keep cruising through the monetization day here at Casual Connect. All right, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks to Casual Connect for giving me the opportunity to speak. This is my favorite conference uh, of the year, and I think it's the most relevant for mobile game uh, developers, so I'm really happy to be here. And you're probably like, what is monetization 2.0 on mobile? Like, what the hell does that mean? Well, basically, I'm going to look at everything outside of game design, what the savvy developers are doing to optimize their revenue. Um, what we're going to cover today is just a brief introduction to TapJoy so you kind of understand why it is we look at this stuff. We're going to look at premium currency exchange rates and why those matter. Currency sales, localization, limited time events, what those are, how those work. Um, understanding advertising solu solutions and player segmentation, and I'm going to finish up with how UI impacts monetization with respects to the store. Um, so real quick about TapJoy, it's one of the largest mobile ad networks out there. We cover a billion devices. Between 2010 and 2012, we've paid out over $200 million in revenue to our publishers. We typically account for around 10 to 30 percent of a developer's revenue. Um, we drive about 1.3 million ad engagements a day. Now, when we talk about ad engagements on our network, those are users completing actions. So whether it's playing a game, another game to level five, watching a video, signing up for Netflix, whatever it is, those are ad conversions on our network. And we interact with about 430 million monthly active users. Um, the way our network works is if you look at the top grossing charts, obviously it's dominated by free-to-play games right now and some other apps. Um, and these games will monetize through in-app purchases, and they'll typically monetize around 1% to 3% of their users. Um, I know it's a small percentage, but if you're on the top grossing charts, that's a million, 12 million a month in revenue coming from that small percentage of users. Where TapJoy comes in is we kind of help them monetize the rest of their users, all the users who are unwilling or unable to buy those in-app purchases. And then we offer it for free in exchange for engaging with our ad. So instead of that monetization rate being 2%, it's 4 to 6%, 10%. And then on the flip side, we drive massive brand engagement, massive app distribution, whatever it may be, through our platform. So because of the way our ad units work, we look very closely at game design in that if users aren't coming back and engaging with the apps, if they don't want to unlock that in-game content, the developer doesn't make any money and TapJoy doesn't make any money. So we look very closely at this stuff and we share it with as many people as possible because we're not making games. So that's why I'm here today. Uh, now on to the fun stuff. So what does it take to make money? And I feel like this kind of goes without saying, but I have to say it. Obviously, it takes a great game. And fortunate enough for developers now, all the market research you need is in the top grossing charts. I, I'm surprised how many new developers I meet who haven't played these games. Like, if you're trying to make money in free-to-play, you should understand everything these games are doing in terms of UI, in terms of core loop, in terms of engagement hooks. In terms of marketing, in terms of what the app icons look like, if you need to understand all this stuff, and it's all right there for you to look at. Like, it's not a secret. There's no, like, secret thing that any of these guys are doing. It's all right there. Um, but everything I'm going to talk about is assuming that you have a great game. So without a great game, you got nothing. You got a great game. All right, now let's look at some other stuff. So one of the things that developers, I see first-time developers make mistakes on is their premium currency exchange rate. Um, so most games have a grind currency, which you earn through playing the game, and a premium currency that's sold through the in-app store. Um, typically, we recommend <clears throat> at least 100 coins, gems, whatever your premium currency is, equal to a dollar. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that, but mostly it gives you a lot of flexibility, especially in terms of monetization. So one of the things that's kind of taking off right now are mobile video ads. We're seeing a lot of brands, a lot of app developers drive distribution through mobile video. However, these units only typically pay out about a cent to two cents a view. Okay, so if your premium currency exchange rate is five coins equal to a dollar, each unit is worth 20 cents, you can't show a video. Okay, or else you're cannibalizing that currency. Um, the other thing, and, and by the way, there's a lot of revenue in mobile video. Um, the other thing is that, that's a weird layout, I don't know why it's doing that, but the other thing is that it lets you boost user engagement. So if your currency is set at such a high exchange rate such that you can give away small amounts to entice users to do, thing, do things, that's a big win for you. So whether it's 
creating an account, signing up for Facebook, sharing their score, whatever it may be, it just gives you a heck of a lot more flexibility when that exchange rate's pretty high. Um, and once you release your game, if you have a low exchange rate, you can't reverse it. You can't take a step back. And I've talked to a lot of developers who regret it afterwards. Uh, here's a quick look. And again, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know why this is showing up funky, because on this computer it's not. But here's a quick look at um, a case study on our platform where a developer, um, their revenue was trending down. So the yellow line is their actual revenue. And their DAU was trending down. So the revenue was trending down with their DAU. Um, and what they did was they undervalued their currency on our platform. Um, so they weren't getting as much video inventory as they should have been getting. And the moment they changed their currency exchange rate, it opened up more video inventory. So their revenue jumped by 54%. Um, they went from doing about 15 to $20 a day in video revenue to about $275 per day. Um, also, anybody who wants this deck, just email me and I'll send it to you. So don't worry about taking pictures if you guys. Um, now on the currency sales, so currency sales are a great way to basically um, entice first-time users to buy uh, a currency package or in, to increase your revenue. And it's a, also a good way to fight the normal revenue dips that happen in the life cycle of a game. So naturally, you're going to have dips in your revenue over time. Um, and the feedback we've gotten from developers is that typical currency sale will give you about 1.5 increase in revenue. Um, we, we've seen higher, 2 to 3x increase but well, we've also seen lower. So it kind of depends on your game. And for those of you who don't understand what a currency sale is, it's no different than walking into a store when there's a sale. It's like a limited time where you get more for your money. 20% off, 30% off this weekend. Um, so you want to shoot for weekends, you want to shoot for holidays, you want to shoot for when a lot of people are in the app, because that's when you're going to see your biggest revenue increase. Um, however, you don't want to overdo it. There's a tendency for some developers to do currency sales back to back to back to back to back. What happens is you end up cannibalizing your in-app purchase buyers, and that they'll just wait for the currency sales. It's something you want to avoid. Um, and then the real savvy developers are targeting these kind of sales and discounts just to non-paying users. So here's an example from Heyday. Um, I was selected for 30% off for the next hour. I guarantee you they're not targeting that to paying users. Um, OK, the clicker's dead. Okay. Here's a case study from, um, so not only are developers doing in-app purchase currency sales, they're also doing currency sales through, tap, uh, through platforms like Tapjoy. So here's a case study from Magic Piano by Smule. And so a, a currency sale through Tapjoy, for example, is get two times more currency for watching a video, get two times more currency for completing this offer. Um, and what they saw is a 2x increase in revenue, 17% increase in the unique users that were monetized through Tapjoy. And afterwards, a 16% uh, increase in revenue that trended higher because more people knew that Tapjoy existed. Um, so currency sales are a great way to boost revenue in the app and through alternative payment platforms as well. Um, now I want to talk about limited time events uh, or what's called the Japanese secret sauce. Um, so these were perfected in Japan and now we're starting to see them here in the Western markets. Um, and the feedback we've gotten from folks like DNA, actually there was a talk yesterday from the head of DNA's uh, gaming studio about Transformers. And they shared a lot of information about limited time events. But the feedback we've gotten is that your ARP down increases by 3 to 5x during these events. And engagement like shoots through the roof. So the data they were sharing yesterday with Transformers was their average um, ARP down was about 66 cents. And it can hit about a buck during these events. Um, so the idea behind a limited event and how it's different than a currency sale is basically you're giving away unique, rare content that's only available during that event, okay? And you can't buy it. The only way you can get this unique content is if you grind, if you're playing a lot. Um, so players have to basically grind to the end of this event, and it could be anywhere from three days to a week. Here's an example from War of Nations. Um, the Alliance Wars is the name of the event, and there's two days left. The Alliance that kills uh, units and gains the most attack points during the event will win. And it's kind of graded on a curve, okay, so that everybody gets uh, items. Everybody wins something, so they feel good about playing the event, right? If you don't win anything, you're going to stop playing, and it's not a very successful event. So everybody's playing, but the top 1%, 2%, whatever it may be, get the ultra-rare item, which here is a platinum event recruit. Um, so 
this has been proven to be obviously very successful in card collecting games and you know, it can work in any kind of collectible game. Um, but we're starting to see it in other types of games um, to a lesser extent. And what I mean by that is not as complex as the uh, Japanese games. But here's an example from Hothead Games, uh, Big Win Basketball, and they basically coincide in an event with March Madness. And it, it really, it's whoever gets the most wins during this event wins certain amounts of currency. So that's kind of a simpler way to do a limited time event um, where you may not have the same framework or the same type of game design as a card collecting game. Um, now I want to talk about localization. Uh, very savvy developers and who have the resources are localizing into foreign markets. And it's not just about localizing, it's about understanding how much money is being made in those markets. So here's a quick look at in-app revenue on iOS and Google Play in the top markets. Um, and as you can see, obviously the US is number one, Japan's number two on iOS and Google Play. Um, and then it goes down. Um, and South Korea is growing at an incredible rate, especially on Google Play. So it's something you can't ignore. Um, one thing about localizing your app and your game is that it significantly improves the chances of getting featured by either Google or Apple. Um, they really only like to feature apps that are localized into those territories, which obviously helps with user acquisition. Um, obviously, Asia is growing, and South Korea especially, uh, as well as Japan. Um, so Distimo looked at apps week over week. So an app that was live in a foreign market prior to being localized and an app that was live in a foreign market after being localized. And what they saw was a 128% increase in downloads um, and a 26% increase in revenue. So imagine that 26% increase in Japan, a 26% increase in South Korea, 26% increase in Germany, France, Russia. It adds up over time to a lot of money. Here's a quick look uh, at a pretty public case a couple weeks ago of Clash of the Clans being localized into Japan. Um, so they were live in Japan uh, for a while and their revenue was kind of trudging along. June 17th, they localized into the Japanese market and their revenue started an uptick. Um, and then they did a pretty public cross promotion with Gung Ho's Puzzles and Dragons and their revenue increased 3x in Japan, or, or in June, um, to where according to this demo, they became the number one grossing app worldwide after this because there's so much revenue being made in Japan. Um, so it's important as an indie developer that you understand the different ad units available to you and you understand what kind of inventory that is and what kind of eCPMs those are because obviously at the end of the day you want to be able to make game two, game three, game four. Um, so I'm just going to kind of quickly go through the main ad units on mobile. You have rewarded offer walls or value exchanges non-rewarded offer walls, which are basically just cross-promotion walls, featured ads or interstitial ads, banner ads, and videos. Um, one of the things you want to do is kind of understand what's right for my audience. Uh, and you obviously want to balance user engagement with monetization, and you always want to err on the side of user engagement. You want to keep those users. You don't want to lose them, so you don't want to upset them in any way. Um, so real quickly to go through the types of games on mobile, you have hardcore games like your card collecting games, Rage of Bahamut, Kingdoms of Camelot. And these games have highly engaged user bases, but much, much smaller user bases. So these guys are playing multiple sessions a day. Um, typically these games will hit an ARP dial between 15 cents and a dollar. And they typically won't put a lot of advertising in their game because those users are so hardcore and those users monetize at such a high rate. At most, they'll put an, an offer wall because it's user opt-in. So the user goes to the store and they have a choice. But it's not interrupting gameplay experience. Um, then you have your mid-core games, which are more like your resource management games, Heyday, um, Ice Age Village, The Simpsons. These have a slightly less engaged user base than hardcore, but it's larger. Um, these games will hit an ARP DAO of around 4 to 15 cents. And typically, these games will have an offer wall. And then depending on the developer's philosophy about ads, they may have interstitial ads and video ads as well, and sometimes the more savvy guys will have those showing to only non-paying users. Um, and then you have your casual games, which is a much lower engaged user base, but a massive audience. And these games typically see massive spikes, right? So users come in and then they leave quickly. Uh, think like a draw something. Um, oftentimes these games are in the top three charts. Um, and these games are monetizing eyeballs over ARPDAO because their ARPDAO is usually only in a one cent range. Um, so they need to have ads kind of plastered throughout. Um, so they have featured ads, interstitial ads, video ads, sponsorships, whatever it may be. They're usually making more of their money from uh, ad revenue. 
So it's just important that you understand what's right for your audience. Now I want to quickly look at store design. So in the free to play world, this is the page, the currency purchase page is where a user decides if they're going to part with their money, right? This is where you make your money as a, as a, as a game developer. So this page is actually, like when I see a lot of first time mobile developers, they spend zero time on this page, a lot of guys, and it just, it shows, like they, they have low uh, monetization rates. Um, so I wanted to quickly compare kind of the good with the bad, because I feel like if I just show the good, it doesn't help you if you don't understand the bad. Um, so one of the themes you'll see with a lot of uh, bad UI is small text. You gotta remember people are on their mobile devices, so even if you're designing on a huge screen or games that are ported over from web, um, oftentimes the text is way too small, so you really need to design for the phone first and use as little text as possible. Um, unimaginative icons, so what I mean by that is on this example on the left, I'm selling different price points of iron bucks. However, my icon is the same size for each one, so I don't visually understand how much more I'm getting for my money, okay? Nothing grabs a user, there's no calls to action. You know, you gotta think about your currency purchase page like a store, like walking into a market. You know, usually they have the sale items up front or their most popular items up front. Nothing like that's right here. Um, and then how much does each package cost? You basically wanna eliminate as much friction as possible. So on the left hand side, if I click on one of those, it doesn't tell me how much it costs, so I have to click on one. Then the in-app uh, purchase uh, confirmation will pop up telling me how much. That just causes a lot of friction for users. You're just adding another click. Uh, now on to the good, and clearly like you instantly see the difference, right? It's very clean, visuals over text. So on the left-hand side, there's a suitcase full of chips, a stack of chips, and then a small pile of chips. Like visually, you quickly understand what you're getting for your money. And as much as possible, you want to move away from words. So you want when users hit your store or any UI to understand visually what's happening faster than reading text. Um, these are clearly designed for the phone, and what I mean by that is they're designed for touch, so they got the, the, the side-scrolling menu. They're, everything's very big and clean. Um, they let users know they're getting a deal, so you get 15 off. Most popular, there's calls to action. It's more likely the user's gonna convert when they see that. The prices are out there. Um, and then, obviously, I think this goes for like the entire mobile gaming market. But UI is so important, and I could talk probably hours about that, but a well-designed, clean store, clean game that's with a thoughtful UI just means a more highly engaged user, a more intuitive user who's more likely to spend money in your game. So that is uh, it. Um, I'm happy to send this deck to anybody, and I have, much, I have more decks I can send you guys to. Um, so, so we'll open up the questions. So one thing I wanted to mention is that after the show, and usually right after a presentation, we post your deck up on our website oh, as well, okay. the Casual Connect website, and then cool. shortly thereafter, there will also be a video of Brian's presentation that you'll be able to share with all of your friends and take outtakes and do auto-tune stuff and yeah. all that stuff with Brian. Good. <laughs> so happy to see that. <laughs> Any questions for Brian? Wow. I was intrigued by the uh, comment that you made about, about UI um, impacting usage. I, th I think that's true throughout free-to-play games, right? If you don't tell people what, and not just in the store itself, but if you don't tell people what's going on in your game, they don't find out by themselves. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of stores are usually like five clicks buried. You know, you want to make it two clicks. Um, you know, people, a lot of mistakes are the tutorial doesn't launch right away. So it just, you lose people. There's a lot, yeah. UI is so important. Well, thank you very much, Brian. I very appreciate you coming out to speak today. Thank you.